started in just a minute here. Um, the <coughs> team of Brian Yu and Brandon Yao is one of our two co-champions in the middle school division at Harvard. They'll be going pro first. The team of Brian Sean and Rohit Jimangikar was the novice champion at Harvard. Uh, they will be going con second. I'm going to give them just a few seconds to finish setting up, and then we will begin. During the debate, please make sure to be silent so that everyone can hear, and so that it doesn't interfere with the recording of the debate. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy it. As the pro team the affirmed the resolution, the United States should end its arms sales to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Our sole contention is exacerbating instability, and our first subpoint is ending the suffering. First, the war in Yemen has unleashed devastating consequences on the poorest country in the region. Robin Wright of the New Yorker reports in 2018 that Operation Decisive Storm has produced catastrophic conditions, the worst famine anywhere in the world in a hundred years. 14 million Yemenis now face starvation, and more than 20 million people are in need of assistance to, to survive. Now, unfortunately, U.S. arms sales to Saudi Arabia are directly contributing to this moral calamity in a few ways. First, incentivizing offensive strikes. William Hart of the New American Foundation explains in 2010 that the Saudi deal consists primarily of offensive weapons, fighter planes, attack helicopters, and guided bombs, which might be used in Saudi strikes against separatist groups in Yemen. And then secondly, these weapons uniquely encourage aggression. Drawn to Armenia of Cato right in 2018 that with these, a nation's calculation about intervention abroad shift decisively. Saudi, Arabia, Saudi Arabia's recent behavior illustrates this dynamic. And finally, studies clearly show that arm transfers increase the risk of militarized interstate disputes and the link is reverse causal. Kraft and Smaldon confirmed this finding in 2002. The arm transfers are significant and positive predictors of increased probability of war. The models explain two-thirds of all war cases. And second, diplomacy. Mohammed Bazi of New York University explains in 2018 that as long as the coalition believes they can crush the Houthis, there's little incentive for it to negotiate. Blinded by its obsession, the administration is undermining the likelihood of a political settlement. And halting sales is the prerequisite to a political and diplomatic solution. Twalko Karman, a famous Yemeni journalist, explains in 2018 that to begin to alleviate this level of suffering, arm sales need to be stopped. Any political solution to the crisis requires the halting of foreign arms sales into the country, and there are several impacts. First, saving lives. Our right evidence is clear that the conflict has already claimed 50,000 lives, displaced millions, and is now threatening half the population with the worst humanitarian crisis in the 21st century. And second, creating failed states is the root cause of major transnational threats. Francis Fukuyama of Johns Hopkins reports in 2004 that weaker failed states are close to the root of many of the world's most serious problems, from poverty and AIDS to drug trafficking and terrorism. And you clearly see all this present in Yemen refer to our right evidence yet again. Our second subpoint is the forever war. War. U.S. efforts in Yemen cannot be divorced from the larger U.S. policy of endless war in the Middle East. Campanus and Hannah explained in 2018 that the line between the Yemen war and America's global war on terror is not a long one. U.S. foreign policy since 2001 has been dominated by direct and indirect interventions. Endless war has been sold to the necessity in a campaign against terrorism, even when U.S. military action makes the world and Americans less safe. And second, Trump is now including drones into U.S. arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Mike Stone and Spetnar report in 2018 that Trump will soon make it easier to export some type of lethal U.S.-made drones than potentially dozens more allies including Saudi Arabia, and this increases the probability of terrorism, specifically in Yemen. Madeleine Zimmerman finds in 2017 that within the first week of a drone strike, the probability of a terror attack has increased, and when the U.S. works with Saudi Arabia, is fighting not only the AQAP, but also the Houthi rebels. Drone strikes contribute to the striping chaos that terrorist groups feed off of, and Jenna Jordan confirmed this finding in 2009, that decapitation of terrorist groups lowers its rate of decline. Going after a leader strengthens the group's resolve, resulting in retaliatory attacks, increasing public sympathy for the organization, producing more lethal attacks. And third, supporting military operations create the conditions that breed terrorism. Mike Horn explains in 2016 that before the launch of Operation Decisive Storm, AQAP will show off once. Two years later, the operational environment is now ideal for AQAP. Millions more Yemenis have been pushed in poverty and made vulnerable to radicalization. And there are two terminal impacts. First, tens of thousands of lives are lost annually to terrorism. Jessica Ravinas quantifies in 2017 that in 2016, more than 13,400 terror attacks took place around the world, resulting in more than 34,000 total deaths. And second, an increase in terror attacks significantly harms the nation's economic growth. J.B. Yunus writes in 2017 that a 2009 paper found an additional transnational terrorist incident reduced and affected developing nations' growth by around 1.4 percentage points. A paper published in 2008 found that one standard deviation increased the risk of terrorism can reduce the country's net FDI position by approximately 5% of its GDP. For all these reasons and more, I strongly urge a pro ballot. Thank you. <coughs> all right, so everyone 
ready? <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. As a concept and partner, Brian and I proudly negate the resolution the United States should end its arms sales with Saudi Arabia. Our sole contention in this debate is international relations. So currently, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia aim to further strengthen relations. Javier David explains the U.S. sealed a multi-billion dollar arms deal with Saudi Arabia, a move that solidifies its decades-long alliance. The agreement was hailed by the White House as a significant expansion of the security relationship, and maintaining U.S.-Saudi relations is key to assuring cooperation. According to the Bureau of Political Affairs, Saudi Arabia plays a crucial role in, maintain in maintaining security in the Middle East. We are working to increase cooperation on maritime security, military preparedness, and armed transfers. An arms sales cement this relationship as mutually beneficial. Michael Knights writes that the U.S.-Saudi strategic relationship is built on a single premise. Washington provides physical security while Riyadh, while Riyadh serves as a cooperative counterterrorism partner. Arms sales are integral, the task of binds Washington and Riyadh together. However, halting arms sales would deteriorate these relations. James Phillips warns that Washington should not torpedo the alliance into the hands of U.S. adversaries. The U.S. should try to insulate vital bilateral security cooperation. Russia judgment destroys an important long-term partnership. And destroying these, Saudi, and these relationships would lead to three disastrous subpoints, the first being a Russia fill-in. So arms sales are a key mechanism for Moscow in the battle for influence. And Borshev Kaya argues that the Middle East regions emerged in recent years as Moscow's second most important arms market. Arms sales matter to the Kremlin because they're a major source of financial gain, but also a tactical foreign policy instrument. Russian arms are more, are more affordable, and they're also a great choice when a country wants to diversify away. And this diversification trend specifically applies to Saudi Arabia. Jeff Daniels reports that Saudi Arabia is pushing to diversify its source of arms suppliers, and the Russians are more than happy to help. Mar Moscow is intensifying efforts to capture business from the Saudis. And ending U.S. arms sales, and we've already seen this in the past, Daniels continues, when the Obama administration put a halt to weapons sales, that moved the Saudis to start looking elsewhere for techno technology, including Russia. And Russia will use these funds to expand its military modernization efforts. John and the Cavalry of the U.S. Naval War College explains, Russia needs arms exports to fund its aggressive but underfunded military modernization plans. And this causes Russian military intervention in multiple countries. Kerry Gallus explains, Russia intends to develop the capability to operate against several neighbors at once. This means military <coughs> adventures, and that causes massive loss of life. For example, Russia's intervention in Ukraine is quantified at ha as having more than 4 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. The armed conflict has taken the lives of more than 10,000 people. Subpoint two is a China fill-in. U.S. response to, to the Khashoggi controversy will bring the Saudis to China. Zara Singh explains that Saudi Arabia has long sought to diversify away from the U.S. and has increasingly stepped up its engagement with China. The Indonesian could turn to could turn to countries such as China to help fulfill its military needs, and this progression risks a military clash. Christina Lin notes that as, as U.S. influence begins to wane, China is seizing a strategic window of opportunity. Uh, China will become more, pro more proactive in the Middle East, but there's a risk of a potential military clash, and this clash would be extremely disruptive, killing millions. Deborah Kalea notes the U.S. and China remain at logger loggerheads over several regional disputes, and the conflict would be intense, disruptive, and protracted. Subpoint C is the petrodollar. So the petrodollar, a term describing the importance of the dollar on oil sales, can only be maintained with arms sales. The Harvard Political Review details that in order to save us a petrodollar, the U.S. needs the immense sale of arms to Saudi Arabia for the Saudis to stay. The linchpin of this relationship is Saudi Arabia's confidence in the U.S. dollar. Strength from the agreement would be detrimental. And these relations are key to preserving U.S. hegemony or power in the Middle East. Charles Shaw, Charles Shaw will tell you that the U.S. dollar is a fiat currency for world oil transactions. The U.S. global hegemony is predicated on this means of control because of a relationship with Saudi Arabia. If that relationship ends, U.S. hegemony ends, and ultimately American hegemony solves Middle Eastern instability. Henry Liu notes that U.S. hegemony offers the hope of rescuing the fallen Arab people. The U.S. <coughs> promises salvation as the one power that can stand against the inexorable historical tra trajectory that is pulling the Middle Eastern downward. The West is providing the ideas, inspiration, and means to move the Middle East into the modern world. For these reasons and more, we strongly urge a con ballot. Thank you. <coughs> So your first card talks specifically about how like U.S. Saudi relations have been solidified by past arms sales. Yeah. Why are new arms sales needed if your evidence specifically says to that continue the, to, to, so to continue this relationship? I give you specifically that this new multi-billion-dollar arms deal is what solidifies its decades-long alliance. All right, good question. Okay, so um, you your second contention talks about like how U.S. actually exacerbate terrorism. Yes. Right? Okay, so since 2014, because of the U.S. war on ISIS, deaths due to terrorism have decreased by 44%. So wouldn't you say that U.S. weapons are actually solving for terrorism? Uh, no, I would say like my contention is really specific to Yemen. 
when we go and intervene in countries, we create this anti-American sentiment. We breed the strife and chaos that terrorist groups feed off of, and this kills millions. Okay, so again, U.S. weapons have decreased deaths by 44%, not just in Yemen, but in the Middle East as a whole. So, I mean, I don't have specific evidence applying that to Yemen, but in general, wouldn't you say that U.S. weapons have been, um, like, pulling deaths due to terrorism downward? No, I would tell you that, like, interventions abroad make terrorism worse. I have a question. Okay, um, yeah, I'll respond really quickly, and then you can have a question. Um, so again, so I'll, I'll just argue again that when the U.S. pulls out of arms sales, that that's going to allow for terrorists to spread their influence even more, causing even more deaths. So if like uh, you know Obama has already pulled out arms sales once, can you like why haven't why haven't we lost our hegemony? Okay, so specifically uh, the whole idea about Obama halting sales, it, he only halted sales to a specific type of weapon. He didn't completely end arms sales to Saudi Arabia. And even if you don't buy that, when he halted sales for two for two years, Saudi Arabia already looked towards other countries such as Russia or China for weapon sales. All right. Uh, yeah, okay. So how do you guys solve for the Yemeni conflict? All right, so we give you two things. First is that like diplomacy is the ultimate solvency for Yemen. It's the only way we can solve for this conflict, and it's worth giving it a shot because clearly four years of conflict hasn't proved anything. And then second, we tell you like fuel on the fire. Even if you don't buy diplomacy link, the diplomacy link, we tell you that when the U.S. comes and intervenes in countries like Yemen and through Saudi Arabia, we put fuel on the fire by giving them like these weapons, which incentivize offensive strikes and make the situation much worse than it has to be. Okay, so wouldn't wouldn't you guys be putting more fuel on the fire because Without without uh, U.S. arms sales, you're allowing the Houthis and Iran to spread their influence even more and take even more lives. No, that's like what my diplomacy stuff is talking about, right? Okay, so why would the Houthis and Iran suddenly want to negotiate? Because no one out? wants to like lose money and lose lives to like basically, you know, no one wants to lose money and lose lives. Clearly, that's just the but fact. But they have a main goal in doing so. Saudi Arabia and Iran both want influence. They need it. They crave it. They've been going at each other for decades now, and the Yemeni conflict is the best way that that they can prove that they have said influence. Right, next question. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so regarding your like Russia Philip stuff, right? Yeah. So you talk about how like it's gonna lead to military modernization. Do you have any empirical evidence of this? Uh yeah, so we've already seen like um with uh Ukraine, they've already intervened in Ukraine and additionally, um Right now, the, the Russian military is underfunded, and when you see, when you add funds to the Russian military, they are devoted to expanding this for their military modernization. I'll actually run some crap. So, brief off time around, I'm going to be starting off with an overview, comparing our two sides of the argument, <coughs> and then moving on to specific responses. Starting my first word. We massively outweigh cell phone aids that come from Yemen. It has already killed 50,000 people, displaced millions, and is now threatening 22 million people plus with them. Without current action, you're literally telling 22 million people to enjoy your death. Cell phone abuse failed states. Failed states are the root cause of the 21st century's biggest problems, such as AIDS, terrorism, and poverty. This will continue to kill millions. In civil wars, disproportionately devastate developing states, exacerbating instability. Dr. Sharon Azar explains. While the countries suffer, however, the relative impact of military expenditures and conflict on third world countries is much greater and often devastating. Finally, is the endless cycle of violence and terrorism caused by American arms sales in interventions in the Middle East. When we go in there and destroy their economy, hurt their infrastructure, and literally kill their families, we're just putting more terrorists into their hands, we're only exacerbating instability. Four years of conflict, four years of fighting in Yemen hasn't proved anything. You need to go for a viable solution. You need to stop arms sales. Let's move on to the first. Let's move on to the first sub point where they talk about like international relations. There's a lot of flaws with this. One, there's a huge double bind. Either relations are dead because of Khashoggi, or the alliance is resilient and will ex exist in both worlds. A, the Jamal Khashoggi killing has effectively ended strong U.S. relations. Max Saudi Fisher writes in 2017, practically overnight, longtime American supporters <coughs> of the alliance are disavowing. It. American businesses are pulling Washington think tanks, are sending back Saudi money. Khashoggi's murder, the primary cause of the breakdown, appears to be. A kind of a tipping point for Congress. B, if relations haven't collapsed, then it means that Saudi Arabia are inherently strong and resilient to major events because they were able to overcome the Khashoggi incident in the Natasha process in 2018. Despite that cry, there's great, good evidence to suggest that this current crisis will become little more than a blip. If any action is taken by the international community of the U.S., it is likely to, to be symbolic and short-lived. Either arms sales don't matter to U.S.-Saudi relations, or like U.S.-Saudi relations will exist like without arms sales. They're in a massive double bind. When the two turn on themselves, Trump's plans to strengthen Saudi relations are backfiring the U.S. and is causing arms sales to be halted. Prime Kumar explains, by appearing to whitewash the Khashoggi murder, Trump has helped ensure that it will remain an issue. Trump could have shown that the United States will uphold its values around the world by ensuring that actions have real consequences, while at the same 
same time affirming that the relationship with Saudi Arabia is important. It would have stabilized the U.S.-Saudi relationship for the long term. Now that the administration has failed to handle this crisis responsibly, Congress may decide it has to act and mandate sanctions, months of hearings, subpoenas, and legislative debates away. All the while, the important work that the United States and Saudi Arabia should be doing to attend regional conflicts is not happening. Let's move on to the uh, like sub points about Russia and China filling. I'm going to group these two together. One, turn U.S. arms sales are worse than Russia filling. Lam Gerberg argues the only approach worse than walking away is what the United States is currently doing, giving the Saudis a blank check for weapons. It's literally killing more people in Yemen. It's not helping. Two, there's no link for six reasons. A diplomatic tension. Adam Taylor writes that at a gathering of Arab leaders, a letter from Putin read, "We support Arab nations and their effort to ensure a safe future." These effort, these comments did not go down well with Saudi Arabia, which accused the Russian leader of hypocrisy. B weapons compatibility. Je Jennifer Spindle explains it's unlikely that Saudi Arabia will turn to U.S. competitor to build weapons order if the U.S. cancels. But then see, there's too many obstacles and high costs. Jonathan Calvary, an expert on this, says Saudi Arabia is in the middle of a major war, and more than 60% of its arms come from the U.S. The Saudi military relies not just on American tanks, planes, and missiles, but for a daily supply, maintains training support such as intelligence and reviewing. Transforming the Saudi military to employ Russian, which is Chinese weapons, would cost a fortune. Even my Gulf stands require years of retraining, it would greatly reduce its military power for generations. It wouldn't make sense. They would go to diplomacy. But then D, like Russia will never sell arms to Saudi Arabia, it will anger Iran, who is Saudi Arabia's biggest enemy. Russia spent the last decade cultivating relationships with Iran, but selling weapons to their enemy, the Saudis, would anger it. It just wouldn't make sense for them to go to it. But then also, China has no desire to be present in the Middle East anyway. Ahmed uh, says Saudi Arabia is aware that it's impossible in the short term to relinquish US to relinquish the US rule in national security in China, which remains less committed politically and militarily. Three, China, uh, Saudi Arabia arms deals are in relations are in a downward spiral, like they're only getting worse. Uh, Samuel Romani proves Saudi Arabia has only purchased weapons from uh, the need for Saudi Arabia to purchase arms from uh, from China will likely decrease in the years to come. As Qatar has been able to covertly purchase China uh, SY-400 missiles and China's a long-standing defense partnership with Iran, the Chinese government is likely to forge stronger links with Saudi Arabia's chief rivals, including Iran. But then let's move on to their contention where they talk about like a petrodollar. There's a lot of flaws of this. One, Chinese investment oil in reverse only supports the petrodollar rather than the petro yuan. Douglas uh, Bullock says in 2018, the US, the US dollar's position as a global reserve currency has been underwritten by Chinese economic policies. But then two, they talk about how arms are like key to the petrodollar. When we stop selling them arms, when like Saudi Arabia stops selling us like oil, like the petrodollar didn't collapse, like the U.S. hegemony didn't collapse, like this is like disproved, uh, like empirically. At the end of the day, it's a clear pro ballot. Okay, am I on the chart? Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Let's begin our time. Okay, so let's begin by responding to their first contention where they tell you that they're going to be exacerbating instability. First, they talk about Yemen, but there's a lot of problems here. First, the conflict is entirely inevitable for two different reasons. A is the root cause. Saudi warfare is inevitable because of the perception of increased Iranian influence and their rivalry with Iran. Trying to remove weapons won't address the root cause of the conflict. The Saudis will still continue to view the war as critical to curbing and defeating Iranian influence in their strongholds. They don't solve for this. But even if you don't buy that, B tells you that Yemeni government support and several terrorist threats undermine any peaceful end to the fighting without United States guidance. Posey and Phillips will tell you that leaving the leader of Iran, Ansar, allowed to run amok will not bring to an end to the humanitarian suffering, but only prolong it. The U.S. cannot afford to abandon its allies and just hope for the best. But second, turn this point against them because of ending arms sales and end United States guidance and support for the war, which leads to a way worse conflict and more deaths for three different reasons. A, there's a lack of coordination. Tom Rogan tells you that if the U.S. pulls its functional support for the Saudi alliance, the Saudis will lose all inhibition about accurate targeting of Houthi formations that American intervention has forced. But then B is civilian deaths. Fatima al sarzar argues that the U.S. military plays a critical role in safeguarding Yemeni civilians by identifying civilian facilities for the coalition so that they are not accidentally targeted by airstrikes. American-produced Patriot missile defense systems have intercepted dozens of Houthi ballistic missiles firing against Yemeni civilian population centers. But C is nuclear proliferation, which leads to a regional nuclear arms race. Rubini reports in 2017 that if the United States no longer can guarantee its allied security, all regional powers, including Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Egypt, might decide that they can only defend themselves by acquiring nuclear weapons, and even more deadly conflict will ensue. But then three is they talk about the famine, but Saudis are already making serious efforts to curb this humanitarian crisis. Mazuki will tell you in 2016 that Saudi Arabia is in fact making serious efforts to reduce civilian casualties and provide aid to Yemen. But then four. And again, again, another turn because of the Houthis. Withdrawal causes Iran and Houthi rebels to take over. That causes even more violence. Al Sarasar continues that the Houthi militia's violent overthrow 
on Yemen's internationally recognized government, backed by Iran, imposed a fundamentalist, sectarian, brutal, and repressive regime. The Houthi militias are a sworn enemy of the U.S. and a tool for expanding Tehran's destabilizing influence. But then five is that look at, look towards what's happening in the status quo. The Yemeni's war is already ending. There was a new agreement last Sunday night where both sides agreed to a ceasefire that will end the fighting and solve the famine. The Guardian will tell you last Sunday night that Yemen's government and Houthi rebels have agreed in withdrawal from Hodidaya. Re redeployment for Hodidaya is a critical part of the ceasefire agreed in Sweden. The true Steel marks a first step towards ending a devastating war, and you can knock out their entire link on this. They tell you the only solvency to any conflict in today's debate is to go for diplomacy. They tell you arms sales and diplomacy cannot coexist. That one card single-handedly knocks that out. They tell you we reached a diplomatic solution with the presence of arms sales. We need not end arms sales just to go for diplomacy. But then their second step point also has a lot of problems. First is that ISIL has been pushed back by United States forces. That tells you that we have arms sales that is solving terrorism. But even if you don't buy that, look towards our Paul Badard card, which prohibits sites in the crossfire. We've seen a 44% decrease in the amount of terrorism deaths since 2014. That is with the coexistence of United States arms sales. Then the CRS will tell you that the amount of arms sales that we're um, spending to Saudi Arabia includes um, counterterrorism efforts. What that means is that the arms that we are selling to Saudi Arabia includes weapons and tactical forces that we can effectively use to combat terror forces. What does that mean? You see that 44% decrease in the Paul Bedard card. We need to have arms sales if we want to solve endless war, as they tell you. But then, one of the impacts they talk to you is about economy. We completely outweigh on this. Look back towards our case where we tell you that military <coughs> modernization that displaced 4 million people in a global power war could kill billions. That outweighs anything about any question of economics. But then lastly is the petrodollar. They try to tell you that the petrodollar is about the petro yuan. That's off topical. The only way we solve for instability in today's debate is to go for the petrodollar, which is a dollar in the use of oil transactions. We tell you in our Liu card that's the only way you solve for instability. And thus, for those reasons and more, we strongly urge a con ballot. Thank you. Talk about like a ceasefire. So, can you tell me when this date is like the actual like demilitarization of Hodeida is? What do you mean the date? Oh. Okay, so like you talk about like a ceasefire in one of your responses. Can yes. you give me the date when the troops are like supposed to pull out? It's just that they have agreed to a critical part of the ceasefire in Sweden. The part okay. of the matter is that yeah. you tell me that the Houthis are not going to negotiate if we don't have arms sales, right? Sure. Yeah. The fundamental flaw in that is that we tell you that even though these rebels are already in mm -hmm. place, we still see them willing to come to the table. Well, I would say that's like fundamental distrust. That's exactly why we've like had so many like Stockholm agreements. Like they've met to the table. Like, what do you mean so many Stockholm agreements? Place? We've only had okay. one Stockholm no, agreement. No, no, like there's like, been like a different parts of like the Stockholm mm -hmm. agreement. Like okay. they've gone to the table a lot of times. But the reason they're like not actually compiling with it, and the reason they're like so afraid of us, is because like it's like fundamental distrust. When we're like putting arms and like fuel to the fire to like the Saudis who want to like destroy them like they're not going to like negotiate with diplomacy like okay. the only way you're going to get this is like if you So you're telling themselves. me that even if we have a diplomatic agreement they have a fundamental distrust right? Sure. Yeah. Cool. The problem with that is you don't tell me how with you solve sales. for this fundamental distrust either but then also when I want to indict you yeah. tell me there's been multiple Stockholm agreements. Tell me about another second Stockholm agreement. Okay, so what I t okay, so is that, first of all, wait, was that plural or singular? That's all. Okay, so first of all, I was misspoking. Like, okay. it's like multiple parts of like the Stockholm Agreement. Okay, but cool. I would still so say there has been no multiple Stockholm Agreements. There's only one. No, there's yeah, but there's like different parts of the Stockholm Agreement. And those like, different parts to. is some, something we don't talk about. Our card is agreement what? from last Sunday night. Your Stockholm Agreement is completely relevant to the okay. discussion we're having. So even if it's from like last Sunday night, first of all, you can't prove me a date. But then second of all, like the Houthis have like broken it like multiple times because like they're not going to like compile with like this treaty. Well, like Saudis are still getting weapons. They're still getting bombs. They're still getting planes. They're still getting all these weapons to kill them. It just doesn't make okay, sense. Okay, two problems there. First, I do give you a date. I mean, it's right there. It says uh, it's February 17, 2019. But then second, you talk no, no, to no, me no, about you how like, a they, date when they're like pulling out. Like, they the agreed to out. go ahead and pull out with the military at this date. Okay, sure. Right? If that's if that's true, when is the date for ending arms sales? You can't give me that for either, right? If you want to indict me on the date okay. that they're not going to pull out, I can indict your whole case off the exact same thing. Well, but the second you talk yeah. to me about these Houthi rebels, like they're like they've already violated the Stockholm Agreement. Sure. Again, that's completely off topical. I don't want to talk to you about the Stockholm Agreement because the Stockholm Agreement is not representative of our case. But mm -hmm. even if you want to talk about the Stockholm yeah. Agreement, the, the the fact that they would come to the table in the first place is okay. is delinking your entire case. But like, can right. I have a question now? Uh, We've said two minutes on sure, this. Okay. okay, cool. So you're talking to me about endless war. Let's talk about tactical forces. Yeah. We give you a Bernard card that you've seen a 44% decrease in terrorist deaths. Yeah. Doesn't that tell you that the CRS card also tells you that you see counterterrorism efforts being deployed with arms sales? Sure. Why do you think we're exacerbating the problem still? Okay, so I would say like the Jordan card is like really behind this. Like before we intervened in Yemen, before we like sold the Saudis arms, like what happened is like when we did that, is like the AQAP, like uh 
like terrorism in like the Arabian Peninsula was like really low. Like they were losing a battle to the these. Like what you saw after we intervened in Yemen and after we deployed like counterterrorism forces. Like what you saw is like an, a massive increase in, like AKP in like Yemen. All you saw is like more death. You saw more instability. You saw like all, all this like cool. That's so happening. even if I don't buy that, the fact yeah. of the matter is that is there a terrorist problem? In Yemen, yeah. Cool. Because, like, so because and, and you're telling like, me, chaos. okay, but like the problem is, if there's a problem, the only way we solve it is through our case. Sure. You give me zero solvency. Why? You give okay, because I tell you, the Bergard card tells you that we sell, we sell counterterrorism efforts, and that leads to decrease in and that's like forty percent decrease. look towards impacts. We massively outweigh on literally every scale. Right now, 22 million people are dying in Yemen. If you vote for the con, you sentence them to death. You know that, and you cannot vote for that. Second, we tell you that it's like emboldened, it's increasing instability because we create this endless cycle of violence, which creates even more terrorist groups and is the biggest impact of the round. Now well, let's move on to our case. First, they have a few things in response to this. They tell you that like Yemen is an enemy, right? Look towards our fuel on the fire link, which tells you that when the U.S. goes and intervenes, we make everything worse. These millions of people would not be dying if the U.S. was not there. And then second, they talk about emboldening terrorist groups. Except look towards my diplomacy link, which tells you that by going in here, we, by leaving, we solve with diplomacy. The only way the U.S. can actually solve for diplomacy is by pulling out and not holding a gun to the Houthis' head. And then finally, they talk about how like when the U.S. pulls out, it makes it worse. First of all, how much worse can it get? 22 million people are already dying. We may as well try to solve for this. And then second, they talk about how there's going to be nuclear proliferation. But I tell you that like nuclear proliferation is political and economic suicide. No one's going to go proliferate because everyone knows that like when you go pro proliferate there's you're gonna have millions of sanctions on you and you're not gonna be able to make money and then finally like the Houthis again diplomacy solves for this and then finally like the Yem they tell you about the Yemeni wars already ending there's a critical flaw with this the Yemeni war this agreement that they're talking about is just an extension of the Stockholm agreement don't buy this it's already been broken I have their evidence it's really clear on this it's just an extension of the Stockholm agreement don't buy this and then finally let's move on to our second question we tell you that like when we go in when we kill their families when we destroy their infrastructure they're clearly gonna like hate us and they're gonna create more terrorist groups they tell you how like terrorism is decreasing right now but we tell you when we kill them right now in the future these teens these children who had their parents killed by the u.s are gonna go join terrorist groups it's a future impact well let's extend some responses first we tell you that they're either weak and they're destroyed right now but even if u.s saudi relations make it through that that just means they're inherently like stable and then second we tell you like four different reasons why russia or china is not gonna fill in there's like interoperability and then it's way too expensive it's gonna take decades to fill in for all these reasons you simply cannot vote for them because they have no link and they have no solvency for this massive war in Yemen that's killing millions. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start running some prep now. Alright, so I'll compare my case and their case. Alright, so is everyone ready? Yeah, ready? So at the end of this debate, you must be voting con for the following reasons, the first being live. So time and time again, Brown and F said, we say through Russia and China fill it, we will see decreased U.S. influence in the Middle East, allowing for either Russian military intervention or a great power war, which risks billions of lives. It outweighs any of the other, uh, any of the pros impact. And second is U.S. hegemony. This goes to our third supplement of petrodollar. Voting con maintains U.S. hegemony through our internal link with the petrodollar. Extend this and you will see that M Middle Eastern instability is solved, which the pros simply cannot do. Now moving specifically to the responses, they talk about this like how um, it's a double bind. So so we don't talk about Khashoggi. Our pivot talks about w uh, with or without arms sales. So we say without arms sales, you're going to see these relations go um, completely destroyed. And then they bring up this turn about how U.S. arms sales are worse. They completely dropped the um, they completely dropped the Al Zar card, which is saying that U.S. military and U U.S. weapons actually save civilians. We've intercepted uh, ballistic missiles, which show that we are not taking lives; we're rather saving them and solving the conflict. And then they have this huge uh, response about how a uh, film won't happen. They give you countless reasons why. So what what we want to say here is that intent outweighs capability. The fact that Saudi Arabia has already looked towards these other countries now um, shows that like without US armistice they are going to look towards Russia they are going to look towards China which creates even which creates an even even worse conflict because of worse weapons and additionally 
Um, regarding the petrodollar, they say like Chinese investment ha um, has, nothing, has, has nothing to do with it. It's unrelated. Without arms sales, you're going you're to see that Saudi Arabia doesn't use the U.S. dollar in oil transactions, which hurts U.S. hegemony. Now, flipping over the flow, um, keep, keep some stuff to extend here. Extend our CRS card. We're just saying that arms already sold for terror. Additionally, extend how petrodollars sold for instability because of the maintenance of U.S. hegemony. And additionally, um, extend, uh, uh, Brandon dropped the response about how Saudi Arabia is already solving for the humanitarian crisis. So extend this, which is saying that in the status quo, you will see this humanitarian crisis solved because of uh, U.S. Saudi relations. And additionally, um, they don't solve for the root cause of the many conflict over terrorism. The root cause here is ethno-religious differences. They show you no solvency for this. So on the pro world, you're gonna see, even, you're gonna see even worse conflict with Russia, Russia, Chinese weapons, and additionally send the Houthi takeover, which even if you buy their whole time frame argument, the Houthis will take over in that time period, which causes even worse uh, conflict. And for these reasons, you must be voting con. Thank you. So in summary, Rohit talks about uh, okay. So Rohit talks about like how U.S. hegemony and like is important because like petrodollar like supports U.S. hegemony. Yeah. So if this is like true, like when Obama ended sales, like did like our economy collapse? Like did her hegemony collapse? What do you mean? Okay. So when Obama ended sales, our, our economy did not collapse. What you're, yeah. what, did US hegemony this, collapse? Is what, this is what you're confusing. Mm -hmm. the, you're trying to say that the amount of transactions we have is the source of our hegemony. That's not true. If you look carefully at our shell card, it tells you that the agreement that was made between US and OPEC uniquely puts the United States dollar currency as the fiat currency, mm -hmm. which means we're using the United States dollar as a transaction value. Yeah. That's what's important. Okay. So even if we had zero sales of anything, if we had zero economic link between the United States and Saudi Arabia, because OPEC is utilizing the dollar, that's what gives us our hegemony. So tell me why like this agreement between like OPEC and the U.S. is like important to like U.S. arms. Okay, because, like, because OPEC and like Saudi Arabia are, like different things. Last time I checked. Okay, yeah. yeah. So um, in our case, we t we say that right now the dollar is a fiat currency for these oil transactions, and that is what maintains U.S. hegemony. And when the dollar is a main currency for these oil transactions, and when you see that is only maintained through arms sales with Saudi Arabia, when when the U.S. pulls out. You're going to see the dollar not. Um, you're going to see the dollar's influence decline, and it basically shows that U.S. hegemony will also decline. Okay, not sure. Cool. Oh, okay, yeah. So when you talk about like how, so Robert brings up ethno-religious differences, right? Mm -hmm. So you talk about how like you're continuously fueling the fire, or yeah. putting fuel into the fire. Even if you remove the fuel, isn't the fuel because they have <coughs> fundamental differences in the way they view like religion and like their ethnical like differences? All right, I think you messed up the analogy here. We're okay, telling right. you like the fuel is the missiles we're giving Saudi Arabia that directly incentivizes them to go and bomb the Houthis and like kill them, right? That's when, not what we're talking about. And then we'll tell about. you like even then, we can solve okay, no, 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 this you're not answering the question. The question is, how do you solve for ethnics? Go ahead. All right. So we're telling you that, like, the only way we can solve for this specific conflict in Yemen is through diplomacy. Even if there's going to be more conflicts in the future, you guys don't solve for this. And the only way we can solve for these conflicts in the future is by, like, stopping putting our gun to the, like, Houthi's head and telling them, if you don't, st if you don't stop fighting, okay. we're going to shoot okay, you. Okay, I understand. But that didn't answer my question at all. I told you to address why ethno-religious differences are going to be solved when we pull out of arms sales. You talk about, like, how offensive weapons, like, incentivize Houthi takeover. Okay, that's not what I was asking. I don't uh, talk about it. We don't talk about it. You talked about how the missiles are going to be able to fight the Houthi. Okay, I'll respond to your question. All right, okay, so, go ahead. Okay, so, like, I would say two things. First of all, like, you talk about like how there's ethnic and religious differences yes. it doesn't make sense to like put more arms to an unstable region that's like number one bad but then mm -hmm. number two i'd say like the main factor here is the houthis rose up because of like our like, because of like money resources and like they didn't get rights from the army government mm -hmm. so i would say like a diplomatic solution a negotiated settlement where we stop giving one side arms and pointing a gun to the houthis head is like what's important like giving the money money rights resources is like key it's like not because of like ethnic okay regions. cool and i would love to believe that but here's the problem we give you yeah. two different villain scenarios which we mean that the conflict you talk about is not only gonna not only gonna get worse but then you you're talking about how, like diplomacy is the unique solution to this debate, and you're talking it about how, like if we're holding a gun to the Houthis' head, they will never make any kind of diplomatic approach. That's yeah. also been disproven two different times. The fact that even when comes on the table is the reason why diplomacy is going to happen with arms sales. Okay, so one ten remaining, starting. It's just going to be my case, their case, and the weighing at the end. 
The pro side massively outweighs. 22 million people will die if you don't do current action right now. Four years of fighting hasn't proved anything. 22 million people on the brink of famine. If you don't do anything, they're literally going to starve to death. You're going to tell them enjoy your death, right? When you give arms to an already unstable region, you're increasing instability and killing even more pe people. We have two links to this. First is the fact that it's viewed to the fire. It doesn't make sense to put more arms, more instability into a region that's already unstable and violent with like chaos and stuff. It just doesn't make sense. Even if you don't buy a diplomacy link, fuel to the fire and just making the conflict so much worse already uh, wins the pro side of this debate. But then second of all, look to diplomacy. The only way you're going to get a negotiated and diplomatic solution is if you stop putting a gun to the Houthis head. They talk about the Stockholm Agreement. The Stockholm Agreement has been broken multiple times. The card they talk about is just an extension of the Stockholm Agreement. Like we need to stop putting a gun to their forehead. We need to actually negotiate with Houthis, like stopping arms us. Like our Twakoy army card is really clear on this. The only way for a diplomatic solution to work is if you stop putting arms us to Saudi Arabia. That's the only way you're going to stop this war. That's the only way you're going to stop from 22 million people literally starving to death. But then also on terrorism, killing their families, hurting the infrastructure, destroying their economy is only going to bring more terrorists. This is bad. They talk about like a Houthi takeover, but like I told you, a negotiated settlement where we give them rights, money, and resources is the best solution. They don't want to take over. They just want the stuff that I said above. But then they also said like how like the Houthis are like efforts to hurt the magic crisis. This doesn't matter. They're blockading the ports. 22 million people are going to die. They're hurting them with offensive weapons. They also say that like counterterrorism is like decreasing terrorism. We're talking about like Yemen. Our gender joining card is really clear on this. After Yemen interventions, like terrorism rights spiked, only more instability, only more deaths. Let's move on to their case. First of all, they talk about international relations. But there's a massive double line. Khashoggi has either killed relations or the like relations are going to be like here either way. Like relations aren't like dependent on arms sales. But then also like they talk about like Russia and China filling. But I would say that like their response to like there's no link doesn't like make this. Like intent always capability. It doesn't make sense. What Jonathan Cavalry tells you, it would take months. It would take years. It would take like thousands. It would take millions of dollars. It just wouldn't make sense for them to spend millions of dollars and destroy their military power for generation. It would make sense for them to go to dim line approach. They don't give a clear response on this. But then also on petrodollar, like when Obama ended sales, like nothing happened. Also they don't give you a link. They don't talk about how like OPEC and like the U.S. is like key for, like for U.S. side relations. They don't give you a link because like OPEC and like U.S. side and like U.S. relations will, like matter with like our arms. Um, it's a clear. Point. Okay, we'll run the remaining one time. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So like Brian did, I'm just going to talk about my case and then respond to their case. Is everybody ready? Let's begin our time. Okay, so at the end of the day for the Conte, our only voting issue is going to be international relations. So Rowan and, Ro and I tell you three different subpoints why international relations are going to be key. First, we tell you United States and Saudi relations are going to be key to making sure that we do not we see cooperation. They try to tell you that, look, we're not talking about Khashoggi. Khashoggi is like a double bind. We never once mentioned Khashoggi in our case. Our Knights card tells you that the only way you see United States and Saudi relations being cooperative is through arms sales and arms sales only. Anything else doesn't matter. But then, to fill in, he tells you that, look, they're not going to be able to do it. Interoperably won't work. He completely drops intent outweighs capability. It doesn't matter how much it costs or how long it's going to take. If you're fighting a person, in this case, in which Saudi Arabia is fighting Iran, would you rather have no weapons or weapons that are going to take a long time or weapons that aren't as well made? What that tells you is that intent completely outweighs capability. You're going to see Russia failing happening. But that what this means is that at the end of the day, you're going to see military modernization by Russia displacing even more mil millions of people. If an underfunded Russian military was able to go and intervene in Ukraine and displace 4 million people, we don't want to know what would happen in a villain scenario in which Russia is able to fully fund the military. But then for Petrodollar, this completely solves their case, which I'm going to demonstrate now. So flipping over, let's talk about like their contention about exacerbating instability. First main problem here is they completely drop al Srazar. What that means <coughs> is that their anti-US image argument gets completely knocked out, which means that because the United States is protecting civilians and not killing them, you're going to see our image going up, which means you won't see blowback, you're not going to see increased recruitment, and you're going to be solving terrorism. But then Brian completely drops our Berdard and CRS cards, which tell you that right now counterterrorism efforts are being included in arms sales. We see a 44% decrease in the amount of terrorism deaths. What that means is it's empirically proven. If you have arms sales, we're not going to see endless conflict. In fact, we're going to be able to solve terror and solve all these problems they talk about. But then lastly, they try to talk to you about how diplomacy solves, and but then at the same time, they try to tell you when we've had diplomacy, the Houthis have broken it 200 times. That tells you even if we have diplomacy, with or without arms sales, they're still going to break it, which means their 22 million card, like about how we're going to see these millions of deaths, is going to get even worse. The only way we can keep these Houthis at bay is with the continuation of arms sales. So at the end of the day, voting for the Conti means you save the most lives, you go for um, to solve Middle East instability, and you make sure you preserve a Middle East, which is peaceful. Thank Well, we didn't have any judges for this round, since so it's just a demonstration debate. Um, so that's pretty much going to wrap it up for us. If you have any questions, feel free to come ask. All the results, like I said, will be emailed out. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, please let me know. And thank you all for coming.